We're starting a, uh, our annual Advent series today, and we'll go through Christmas Eve. And so today in the next three weeks, let's go to the next slide. Uh, just as FYI, here are the verses. You, you can jot them down if you want. And we're going to be going through uh, these next few weeks in, in this series. So we're going to spend a bulk of our time in the Old Testament. Now, what does the word Advent, we don't usually use that word, mean? Well, it comes from the Latin for arrival or coming. That's what it literally means. So it's just a fancy word for arrival, coming. Advent remembers, so this season remembers and celebrates the first arrival of Jesus Christ. All right, that's Christmas. I think the whole world knows that. But the season of Advent also looks to the future and anticipates the second coming of Jesus. So that's what the season is about. Because the good news of Christianity is what? That Jesus will one day return to the world. Amen? All right, he's coming back. So that truth is great hope and great joy for all Christians everywhere. If he's not coming back, then what's the point of celebrating his, the first time he came? When Jesus come, comes back, all sin, death, and evil will be gone. Disease, sickness will be wiped away. Uh, but for now, in this world, we wait with expectation and hope. So Advent looks to the past, but also looks forward to the future. That's the beauty of this season. So Christmas, it's not just Christmas and what Jesus did and when he came, but also looks forward to he's coming back. Now, today's verses that we're going to read might not seem very Christmassy at first, but for sure, and for sure the first readers of Isaiah chapter 7 would not have thought about baby Jesus born in a manger, but on the other side of the cross, these verses really are sweet to our soul. And I think we can say an amen to that. Now, <coughs> during my, uh, so I'm from Texas. And uh, during my grad school days, I was in the Dallas area. And when I was a youth pastor at a church in the Dallas area, I remember one of the high school students, uh, one of the guys, he asked me how I knew that God was real. Right? How, how, how do we know that God is currently with us in our lives? Because for this student, he was admitting to me, which was fine, he admitted that he, so many times when he would pray, he just felt that he was just talking to a wall. And he felt that nobody out there was listening to his prayers. That it was just echoing off the wall and then just empty. So he really wondered if God was really there with him. Now, how could, we, how could he know that God was there? Later on, I moved from the Dallas area. I lived in Maryland on the East Coast. And I, when I first, the church I was a part of there in Maryland, I, the first week I met a guy there at church who was involved in serving every week. He would go with me to visit college campuses, to see college students. He would arrive early on Sunday to help set up for Sunday service. He would stay late to help clean up make sure things were just put away. I mean, this guy was really, really involved. But I realized over time, his involvement became less and less consistent. He stopped arriving early. He stopped staying late. Eventually, he was inconsistent in attending every Sunday. So he was, in a sense, dropping off. And months later, he visited the church office and he wanted to talk to me. And he admitted to me that his passion to serve the Lord was not there anymore. I know that his desire was basically gone. But then he asked how he could know that God was truly, really there in his life. How do we know that God is really with us? Well, I asked this guy if he prayed. And he said, yeah, he, he tried to pray, but he didn't feel that God was there to listen to his prayer. I asked if he read the Bible. He said he tried, but he didn't feel that God was speaking to him. 
I asked if he believed the gospel. He said he didn't know. Maybe one or two of us today here or watching can relate to what these two gentlemen experienced. Or maybe you know of someone who has these questions. How do we know God is really here with us? How do we know that he really exists? How do we know that he really cares about our lives? You know, sometimes people who don't believe in God say that they will believe if they what? If they see proof. If they somehow see a sign or a symbol, then they might believe. Because if there was a 100% sign that could not be denied scientifically, then yes, of course, then people should believe. You know, if only God would show a sign, then Christianity would be true. I don't know if you talked to anyone like that. Maybe you did during Thanksgiving. And to quote, this will probably date me, to quote the old Ace of Base song, if you know that group, Seeing the sign would open up the eyes. So I guess a couple of you know that reference. Now, other times people might say that they want God to show them proof that he cares about them. So I believe in God, but I just want some, a sign or a proof that God really does care about me. That he's really with me in person. Right? If only God could just show some type of sign to Christians then we would really know that he exists, then he really loves us. I remember when I changed my Facebook status a few years ago from single to dating in a relationship, and then who it was with, it was Katie, I I got the most comments and likes ever on Facebook for me. And then one brother commented, and he's also a pastor, he said, God really does exist, right? For a woman to want to date me, right? He must really exist. Like, wow, I love you too. For some people, in their mind, it's either, you know, if you're dating or you get married or maybe if you have a kid, okay, that's the sign that God is for me. Now, in Isaiah chapter 7, King Ahaz, or Ahaz, if you want to say it, but we'll say Ahaz. King Ahaz of Judah, he's in a difficult situation. Hundreds of years earlier, his country was split in two. Israel had revolted against the king, an earlier king, and now there was a northern kingdom called Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. And Judah followed this king called Ahaz because he was descended from the great King David. But Assyria, which was the superpower in the Middle East at that time, decided to conquer all the smaller countries in that area. And these bad guys, the Assyrians, wanted to just gobble up all the other lands and go all the way to Egypt because they really wanted to conquer Egypt. And so who was in their way? Well, there was Israel, there was Judah here, and there was also a country called Aram, A-R-A-M. So the kings of Israel and Aram formed an alliance. And they asked Ahaz, hey, join us so we can fight back against the Assyrians. But Ahaz refused to join them in in this fight. So what did the kings of Israel and Aram do? Well, they decided, well, if you're not going to join us, we'll just attack you and conquer your land for ourselves. And that takes us to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. So you can look in your Bibles or on the screen. It says this. This took place during the reign of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Aram's king resident, Israel's king Pekah, son of Remaliah, went to fight against Jerusalem, but they were not able to conquer it. When it became known to the house of David that Aram had conquered Ephraim, or otherwise known as Israel, the heart of Ahaz and the hearts of his people trembled like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. The Lord said to Isaiah, go out with your son Sher Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly because of these two smoldering sticks, the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramalia. For Aram, along with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia, have plotted harm against you. They say, let's go up against Judah, terrorize it and conquer it for ourselves. Then we can install Talbil's son as king in it. This is what the Lord God says, it will not happen it will not occur. 
So God sends the prophet Isaiah to tell this king Ahaz, don't be afraid, calm down. Why? Because God would be with his people. He's going to protect them. Isaiah is telling Ahaz, trust God and believe in him. But because our sinful hearts are fickle, and because we, if we're honest, so many times lack faith, God, in his goodness, he doesn't swat us away or kick us out. He actually continues to approach us. And that's what we see starting in verse 10. So, it says this, Then the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. All right, what is a sign? Well, it's a symbol that represents something or someone. That's what it is. And a sign exists as proof, biblically speaking, that the sign giver is real, and the sign giver is not made up by chat GPT or some artificial intelligence. So here in Isaiah chapter 7, God tells this king Ahaz, through Isaiah the prophet, that everything, even though it looks crazy on the outside, you're about other people trying to conquer you, everything's going to be okay. And to show how serious he is, God then says he will give a sign. But what's interesting here in verse 10 is that God tells Ahaz to what? Ask for a sign. And what kind of sign is God willing to give? Well, it says at the end of verse 10, as deep as Sheol, which is the underworld, and as high as what? Heaven. Now, right now in our world, there are many wars and violent conflicts. So we saw in the video earlier, Ukraine. And ironically, right now, there is a war in the Middle East, just like what's going on in Isaiah chapter 7. All right, let's say God approaches a leader in one of these regions of conflict in the world. And he says to this person through somebody, I will be with you. But to show I mean business, you should ask me for a sign. It can be deeper than the deepest oceans. It can be higher than the highest mountain peaks. Ask me because I am now, that's a hypothetical situation if that were to happen in the, real, in the real world, but it really did happen here in Isaiah chapter 7. Mr. King Ahaz is given basically a blank check by God to ask for what? Anything. Right? It can be as high as the highest, as low as the lowest, or anything in between. God is telling Ahaz, hey, you can ask me for anything spectacular or miraculous that you want. Wow. In Judges chapter 6, the man Gideon asked God for a sign. He wanted to know for sure that God was really with him. And so on the screen, we read the following. Judges chapter 6, 36. Then Gideon said to God, If you will deliver Israel by me, as you said, I will put a wool fleece here on the threshing floor. If dew is only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, I will know that you will deliver Israel by me, as you said. And that is what happened. When he got up early in the morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung dew out of it, filling a bowl with water. Gideon then said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me speak one more time. Please allow me to make one more test with the fleece. Let it remain dry and the dew be all over the ground. That night, God did as Gideon requested. Only the fleece was dry and the dew was all over the ground. Amazing. Now, that's an interesting sign, don't you think? Using a fleece and dew. Now, if that was me... Um, this is just me speaking personally. If I was in Gideon's situation, I'm not going to ask for a fleece and wet dew or not. I think I would ask this. Probably one thing I would ask is I would want my favorite team, my favorite sports team, to win the championship. 
So I'm a University of Texas at Austin grad, hook em horns. So if you like USC, I'm sorry. And so I want my team to win the college football playoff national championship. So the rankings come out today, and I'm praying they'll play in the Rose Bowl January 1st. I'm going to go. So that would so be a prayer of mine. But you know what I would also ask God for? The sign? I would probably also ask, if I was, because I'm here in California, please make gas less than $2 a gallon. Please. Like, please. Right? Then I'm like, yes, Lord, thank you. What about you? What kind of sign would you ask God to give you? What would we want God to give and to show that he is really with us? Because this is the offer made, given to the king, King Ahaz. He's being given an opportunity that so many of us would really want, right? Ask for anything. And make it a big, big, big ask. Verse 12. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. Okay, is King Ahaz a spiritual man? Right? He's, he's being spiritual, right? I don't, I'm not, right? He doesn't want to test God. He doesn't want to challenge God. Right? He, he, he wants to follow what Deuteronomy 6 is saying. So on the screen, this is what Deuteronomy 6, 16 tells us. Do not test the Lord your God as you, the Israelites, tested him at Massa. Carefully observe the commands of the Lord your God, the decrees and statutes he has commanded you. So the king has passed the test, correct? Right. God gave Ahaz, the king, a blank check to cash, but Ahaz realized, aha, it's a trap. So he refused to ask. He did not want to test God. Now I wonder if any of us today, if we think this way like him. So we want God to show himself to us in our lives. We want signs in our lives to confirm that he is real, that he is with us. But when it comes time to ask God in prayer, what do we do? We don't ask. We think God is somehow playing a trick on us. So we what? We stay silent. We don't pray. Now, I know for myself, a big struggle that I have when I pray is that my prayers, I'm just speaking for myself, my own prayers are really weak. I, 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 I struggle with weak prayers. I don't, so many times, I do not ask God for big, bold things in my life, in the life of our church. Because this is the way my weird brain works. I think that at times I'm bothering God with a request, or maybe I will make him mad or upset with me with my outrageous request. If I ask for something really crazy out there, maybe it's too crazy and God's just going to look at me, you idiot, why would you ask that? So that's in my mind. And then when I think that way, I start thinking that I need to do everything in my life with my own strength and my own wisdom. i got to do it by myself. And then I forget that my strength and my wisdom come from who? So this is a matter of faith. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be what? Open. But King Ahaz here says what? No. He refuses to ask for anything even when God offered. God is offering to him. He says no. So what's the response? Verse 13. Isaiah said, listen, house of David, is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? So Ahaz is condemned for his lack of faith. How do we know that he does not have faith? In verse 11, it says, the Lord your God, 
right? Speaking to the king. But in verse 13, it changes to what? My God, thank you. So it's not Ahaz's God anymore. So Isaiah is doing what? He is rebuking the king for not trusting God. God has been rejected. Faith has been refused. And in 2 Kings chapter 16, we see who King Ahaz trusted more, trusted in more than God. So it's on the screen. Then Aram's king Rezin and Israel's king Pekah son of Ramalia came to wage war against Jerusalem. They besieged Ahaz, but were not able to conquer him. So Ahaz sent messengers to King Tiglath Pileser of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. March up and save me from the grasp of the king of Aram and of the king of Israel who are rising up against me. Ahaz also took the silver and gold found in the Lord's temple and in the treasuries of the king's palace and sent them to the king of Assyria as a what? Bribe. So sisters and brothers, before you and I, before we go condemning this king as a foolish idiot, we probably should examine ourselves first, right? Because if we are honest, we are just like this man so many times who had no faith. Instead of trusting God, we can so easily do what? Trust in riches, in wealth, our possessions, our stuff, our bank accounts, our retirement accounts. Instead of having faith in the God who promises to be with us, we want to be what? With people, with other people who have power or success or wealth or fame. Instead of asking God to help us, we do what instead? We ask others to fill the deepest needs of our hearts and our souls. Sadly for this king, he had no faith, even though his ancestor was who? King David, the man who had faith. So what does God do with this no-faith king? What does God do in response to the many times you and I do not ask him in faith and pray? Well, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him what? Manuel. So God decides to give a sign, even though the king did not ask for one. And this sign is not a nature event like an earthquake or a solar eclipse or some hurricane. What is the sign that God says he's going to give? A virgin will conceive, get pregnant, and then give birth to a baby boy. And then this baby will be called Emmanuel, which if you have a footnote, Bible of footnotes, it means God is with us. Now, that is an interesting and unusual sign, don't you think? A virgin will have a baby boy. Now, critics of Christianity, people who say Christianity is false, the Bible is not true, will rightly point out that the Hebrew word for virgin here in verse 14 also means young woman. Because how can a virgin get pregnant? That's impossible. Anyone know one one know of a virgin who got pregnant personally? If you do, let me know. No, it's impossible. So, you know, think like, scientific mind, that's impossible, right? You Christians are just inserting words into your Bible. It should not be virgin. But the Hebrew word for virgin specifically meant a young lady who is not yet married. So the sign here in Isaiah 7 is that a lady who's currently a virgin will have a baby, and then this baby is the sign that God is with his people. So look at the next couple of verses, verses 15 and 16, Isaiah 7 says this, By the time he, this baby, learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, 
He will be eating curds and honey, for before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. All right, so what is God saying? God is saying that this baby boy to be born is the sign that God will protect his people. You're thinking, huh? Beginning of Isaiah chapter 8, we won't read those verses, a baby boy is then born to Isaiah and to a young lady. Baby's born. So Isaiah 7, baby's going to be born a virgin. Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah is the dad, the lady's the mom, baby is born. All right, so what should we be learning this morning from Isaiah chapter 7? Well, we're going to just remember just one thing. I think it should be this. God gives signs to show he is with us. God gives signs to show that he is with us. All throughout the Bible, God gives signs to show that he is really God. He gives signs to show that he is not distant or far away. No, he is the God who is always, always, always with us. Amen? For example, in Genesis chapter 9, there is the sign of the what? The rainbow, the very first rainbow, which means what? The rainbow, rainbows are not really for the LGBTQ+, all those other letters movement. Okay, They just, they stole that. No, the rainbow is God's sign that he will what? Never again flood the whole world. That's his promise, the sign. God gives the rainbow sign as a visual to remind us he is with us. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, Ahaz's ancestor David fights a giant man named who? Goliath. Goliath is taller and stronger and bigger than Shaq and Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille's a big man, but Goliath is even bigger. But David, what, kills Goliath with just one small stone. So God uses David as a sign to show that he is with his people and that he will always protect them. And here in Isaiah chapter 7, a baby born to a virgin, a young woman, is a sign. This baby is proof positive that God will protect, that God will save. God gives a baby boy as a sign that he is with his people. All right, who are his people? Well, God's people are those who trust and believe in him. Here's what the end of verse 9 of Isaiah 7 tells us. If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. Sadly, King Ahaz did not stand firm in his faith. How about us today? If we're honest with ourselves this morning, faith is difficult, correct? It is not easy. We can be like the two guys I mentioned earlier. Right? They're struggling to wonder, and they're asking me if God is real. Right? They grew up in church. Right? They heard about Jesus in the Bible. Now they're wondering, hey, man, is, is this real? And like them, it is natural for us to ask questions. Right? How do we know God is here with us? How do we know that he really exists? How do we know that he cares about us in our lives? Because the reality of living in our world is that hope can be hard to come by. The Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays might not be the most wonderful time of the year. If there is what? If there is family drama, if you're fighting with your siblings or your cousins, or if a loved one is no longer with us. Right? It's not that happy. Or we might think that God does not care about us when there is so much violence and evil in the world. Why, God? Why would you allow this to happen? Or we might think that God has abandoned us, does not care about us, and we cannot seem to be getting out of a depressing situation. 
We're constantly in the same struggle or the same trouble or whatever it might be, and we're just wondering, God, do you really care? And if we say that we believe and we have faith, then why do we have hardships and struggles in this life? Why can't God show himself more than just rainbows and other signs in the world? Right? Why can't God give us even a better sign? Well, I want to share a true story that I think will help us. There was a young man named Joe who was engaged. And Joe was really excited to marry this lady that he's engaged to, and he was looking forward to their life together. He's all planning out everything. Yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But before the wedding day came, His world was turned upside down. His fiance told him that she was pregnant. So now he's confused. He's devastated. I've been waiting for the wedding day, and you're pregnant. And he's hurt. And disappointment, a little anger is welling up in his heart. How could she do that? Right? Didn't she love him? Right? He loved her. Why would she do this to him? And then to make the situation crazy, Joe's fiance then tells him that she was still a virgin. Impossible. Like, where'd you go to school? Okay, no, 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 no. She is lying. She's a terrible person. Okay, so what are Joe's options here? He could, you know, go on his computer, post or on his phone, post on social media how ugly and nasty and terrible and horrible person she is. How dare she? Call her all these names. He could publicly shame her. Can you, can you believe what, what, this, what this lady did to me? I mean, I trusted her. She did this to me. And then, right, and if you're thinking about his options here, for sure he's, he's, he has to end this engagement, right? I mean, it's not his kid. There's no way that she's a virgin. She must have had a secret lover, and she has betrayed him. And then Joe starts thinking, how could God let this happen? Didn't God care about Joe? How could Joe ever believe again that God was with him, that God cared about him when God would allow this situation for his fiance to get pregnant? And then she's claiming that she's a virgin. Okay, but since he doesn't want to embarrass her too much, and even though his heart is broken, he will do what? He's going to secretly end their relationship. Because for sure, once people find out, she will become a social outcast. Maybe her family will disown her. And so as he's thinking about doing this, we continue this true story in Matthew chapter 1. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated... God is with who? Us. The good news of Christianity is that Jesus Christ is the sign that God has given to us. Amen? Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. He is the God who is with us right now. Jesus is the sign that God is real, that God exists. He is the sign that God actually does care about us. He is the sign that all of our troubles and trials in this world that we experience are not meaningless. 
That's important. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, born from a virgin. He lived a perfect life, right? He died the death on the cross for sinners like us. He was raised from the dead. He went back to heaven. And one day, Lord willing, sooner than later, he will what? Return. And the only proper reply to this good news is to what? Is to trust him in faith. Believe in him. That he is the God who gives signs. He is the God who became a human to be with us. That's what Emmanuel means, that he shows his love and his care to each of us every single day. So if you are not a Christian and you're watching, what do you think about Jesus Christ? Do you see him as a sign from God? Because this time of Christmas carols and Gifts and joy and hope, they mean absolutely nothing without Jesus. It's a bunch of fluff, but there's no Jesus. He is the reason for the season, but if you are not a Christian today, will you believe? Now, for those of us who say we believe today in Jesus Christ, that we are sinners who repent of our sins and we want to constantly believe and trust in Jesus as the perfect sign, okay, what do we do with this good news? Well, like Isaiah, we tell people to listen and see. Because that's what the prophet Isaiah did here with the king. So a good question for all of us is, who can we share and tell to this month? And as a church, we have the opportunity this week and next Sunday to share the good news through the Angel Tree Christmas ministry. We've been given the privilege to go tell people next Sunday and interact with them the good news of Jesus Christ, that he's the perfect sign. So I just want to encourage all of us to participate. Let's do this together. Let's point people to Jesus Christ. Let's love people who show up next week. We have the opportunity. Now, the reality is, on this final month of the year, each of us, all of us here without exception, all of you watching without exception, we have each faced struggles and difficulties this year, have we not? There are sin struggles. There are situation struggles. There are family or work or school struggles. Life is full of struggles. The longer we live, the more struggles we have. Amen? But when Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, he showed, he showed that he wanted to be with us. He wanted, right? Did we get that in our minds? He wanted to be with us. When we did not want to be with him, he wanted to be with us. He came to save his people from their sins. He came to desire a relationship with us. And he wants us to what? Keep believing and keep trusting in him no matter what is happening in our lives. I'll end by reading a couple of Bible passages. And I hope these verses remind us and encourage us of the great hope that we have in Jesus. Romans chapter 8. What then are we to say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us. He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him, also with him, grant us everything? In Isaiah 41, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to just have this look briefly in Isaiah chapter 7. Father, if we're honest, especially for those of us who've grown up in church, we look at a verse like Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and we just 
jump immediately to the New Testament, just think about Jesus, and we so easily forget about the circumstances of when these words were first spoken. And they were given to the king who trusts and believe in you. And sadly, he did not. Father, may it be that all of us here, everyone watching, we would not fall into that same mistake and sin. That we would again today trust in you, believe again that you continue to give us signs to show that you're with us. You have given us the perfect sign, your son, Jesus Christ, Father, to be the one who is with us. So, Father, with this good news that we have, please help us to have wisdom to share this, to tell this, to remind one another again today. We have so much through faith in Christ. No matter what happens in our lives, we can say that you are good always, and all the time, you are good to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.